the uh, settlers being given these uh, unresponsible amount of weapons and being uh, allowed to use it and they know they cannot get punished you know every day every day we hear about new attacks from the settlers in remote areas in the west bank every day and this could move easily to a, a city in the west bank to a town Mr. Isaac and um, Mr. Rufat Kassis, uh, both of whom I'll uh, speak as a long introduction, and many of you, most of you, many of you know uh, these two gentlemen, um, have been involved uh, from the beginning um, of the, the Kairos Palestine movement from the publication in 2009 of the Kairos Palestine document, the subsequent founding of Kairos, uh, Global Kairos for Justice. Uh, both continue to uh, be leaders um, in that organization and in that really that hub of energy, of spiritual and activist um, direction that has really fueled and continues to motivate. And it... All right, so listen, we have got uh, big, 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 big questions uh, to discuss. So let's get right down to it, and not a lot of time. I'm going to begin with you, uh, with you, Reverend Mutter. Um, perhaps um, not by, I'm sure not by design, you've become a bit of a household word uh, in the church, uh, in church circles all over the world since your Christmas um, Christ in the Rubble sermon, uh, which has been viewed by probably tens of thousands of people, and you've had multiple appearances in the US media. Uh, since then, and you have made several visits to the United States since October, the most recent, uh, I believe, just last week. Um, so my question is, on the basis of especially what you've, you've, what you've been learning um, in the past months, what are your thoughts and impressions um, from your meetings in the United States that might help us in our strategy? Um, to engage and mobilize the churches in the United States to to have a real impact on uh, on U.S. policy, and uh, Rifat, I will invite you to uh, chime in on this as well. So thank you, Mark, for inviting us for this important conversation. And uh, I'll delve right in. The question is, how can church churches in the U.S. Um, be more uh, strategic in impacting? Uh, policy makers and decision makers. Um, and, and let me begin by saying I'm actually not very uh, optimistic about the prospects or about uh, appealing to politicians. Uh, you know, once they are in, in, in power, it seems that they are only concerned about um, the party line. Uh, they seldom, you know, try to do what's right, to be honest. It seems to me that uh, all politics is uh, completely dominated by what is uh, for the best interest rather than uh, what is right and what is ethical. I've been uh, crying out uh, for the last few months that what's missing in the political discourse is precisely integrity and, 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 and morality, uh, especially since uh, most of my visits actually revealed that uh, one talking to uh, for example, congressmen and or their staff, uh, with the exception of some Republicans, uh, the majority actually know what's happening on the ground. It's not a matter of raising awareness. Sometimes it is, I must admit. And with some politicians, you know, uh, it feels they're so ignorant, especially some congressmen. But with the senators and, and some of their staff, they're very well informed about the reality on the ground. Uh, but uh, they are uh, nevertheless still supporting Israel because it's in the best interest of their party line or uh, those who supported their uh, campaigns. So what can be done? I think churches must appeal and must continue to persist and nag and disturb uh, politicians. And we are at a stage where sending emails doesn't work uh, anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you're sending an email a week or two emails a week, and unless you mobilize the whole group of people to send and meet with their delegation. Uh, I think what I'm saying is that there needs to be persistent 
there needs to be a, a strong effort to contact the politicians. Uh, and second, there needs to be a strong effort, uh, you know, uh, before these politicians are uh, uh, in position of power, before they are voted. Um, and uh, the Israeli lobby is very good in uh, catering and reaching out to potential candidates. I think it's time that they hear from church leaders where do you stand on certain issues uh, before they are elected. I think they need to be called out publicly about where they stand. And the reason is that we are at a time where I believe it's well established that Zionism uh, is a very, very clearly is a racist ideology. Uh, Zionism and apartheid are not apartheid are not that much different, and as such, it becomes uh, morally wrong to support Zionism anymore. So church leaders must use this language. It's not just about we're concerned about Palestinians and human rights, but it's that you know you cannot be a faith. You, you know, from a faith perspective, defend the support of Zionism. Um, but at the end of the day, to be honest, you know, uh, I have more hope in what's to, going to happen in the States. I, I'm building more hope on, uh, and I will be watching what happens in September, not in November uh, with the elections. September is when universities resume. Will those courageous university students return to their standings, to their nonviolent uh, demonstrations? Uh, will their voices be heard? Uh, and I want the church leaders to have the same attitude like that of the university students. Sacrifice, sacrificing their careers, their degrees, their graduations, uh, persisting, not giving up, being willing to be arrested. This is what we want to see from faith leaders right now when it comes to how they relate to power in the United States. All right, thanks, Mutter. I have some follow-up questions, but I would love to hear uh, from you, Rufat, on this question, and then I'll, I'll hold my questions. Uh, I think I, I would add maybe two more points to what uh, Monzer was was saying. Uh, I think there is an um, um, importance of uh, building broad-based coalitions, interfaith, interdenominational, but also with social movement and student movements, because I think what Munder said about the student movements, I mean, this is becoming a leverage, this is becoming an important movement which we have to align uh, with. So collaboration with other faith groups, domination, social movements, student movements, Jewish, Muslim, secular organizations, Committed to justice and peace in the Middle East, I think this could be something which can uh, can be done. My second point is about how can we engage youth uh, and new church leaders, theological leaders uh, as well. And this definitely needs some more uh, investment, uh, working with uh, theological faculties, uh, working also with uh, new clergy, uh, new church leaders, theologians, uh, providing a platform for their voices, uh, strengthen their advocacy efforts. I think these two points uh, are, I mean, important uh, to pursue. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, there are lots of people who are listening here who may be resonating with this. And what I would do is encourage you, I will put... Um, I'll put my email in, in the chat just in case I can't find it otherwise. Um, if you have suggestions, uh, specific, particularly about how to connect with other social movements and how to get into, how to, how to penetrate the seminaries uh, and the graduate departments of theology, et cetera, I agree with both of you that campuses uh, are particularly important and that if, if we can get to the to the to the students who are studying now to be future leaders in the in in the churches and in their communities, that's really that's really important. Also, I wonder about <clears throat> um, trying to work with um, with uh, Christian colleges uh, and with Christian um, uh, you know, campus related groups. Most big campuses have Jewish, Muslim, and Christian. Uh, 
clubs and campuses, and they've got their own pastors and, and, and youth and campus ministers. Um, and so I think that that could be very fertile field. So <clears throat> let us know what your ideas are, the, those of you who are who are listening, and uh, and let's get them flowing or put them right in the chat now, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep the we'll keep the chat going. My follow up question to both of you also is. Um, and Muncher, I'm, I'm interested in maybe what you heard from your meetings with church leaders last week in the United States. What we've always, always been told when we canvass on Capitol Hill, when we lobby on Capitol Hill by AIDS is don't, if you talk about social justice and morality and ethics, their eyes will glaze over. You don't want to hear about that. If you talk about what is and is not in the national interest of the United States, then they they start to listen because as you pointed out, Mother, it's it's a very very political environment that we're operating in. So I I do agree that we need to be thinking about what kind of pressure to exert and where that pressure comes from from the grassroots to change the to change the political wind. Although I'm wondering whether there is some force of faith and morality and conscience. And perhaps that comes from evangelical leaders as well, Munter, and I know that you were meeting with them. So I wonder if either of you have any any thoughts about that uh, and about... Um, so so let me say that... I have of optimism about that. No, I think uh, I, I, I fully agree that we must work in interfaith circles right now and alliances. It's really important so that to show that Palestine is, is, an, is, a, is a moral case. It's an ethical issue. It's a human issue. It's not a religious as if conflict between two religions. Um, so uh, I fully support the idea of creating new alliances for interfaith. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to the youth, I think, Mark, they are concerned about issues of social justice. I think they, there is a sense of awareness. And we have uh, for so long uh, considered evangelicals as if they are a hopeless case. Uh, however, most recent studies show that the younger the age is uh, among evangelicals, studies among evangelicals, the younger evangelicals are, the more likely they are to be pro-Palestinians. Uh, and, and in fact, the uh, equation shifts completely for evangelicals 21 and, and under, 20 and under, who seem tend to be more pro-Palestinian than uh, uh, pro-Israel. And the reason is uh, not just dissatisfaction with their uh, parents and grandparents' rhetoric and, and evangelical Christianity, but most studies show that the reason is there is a strong uh, desire and thirst for social justice issues uh, there is definitely more awareness about what's happening with the social media age. Uh, you know, younger people uh, don't have a problem, for example, watching Al Jazeera, uh, unlike maybe the uh, older generation. So we see a shift uh, among younger evangelicals. I was in, in the United States. I met with many uh, young uh, emergent evangelical leaders who are very disturbed of Christian Zionism and uh, have no problem calling the actions as genocide and allying with us in trying to uh, lobby towards an end to what's happening and, and future justice for Palestinians. So uh, there is definitely uh, uh, some change. Um, maybe my pessimism or uh, uh, the lack, I'm not that encouraged about it because the cost was so high uh, for the people of Gaza. And I feel it's already too late to bring anything positive for the people of us. I mean, if it takes 80 years to build it, uh, should we celebrate that some evangelicals are shifting? That doesn't mean that our commitment is is uh, should uh, change and that we shouldn't continue to work because what could happen, what happened in Gaza could happen in the West Bank. So we need to think, uh, you know, uh, about the future and uh, really intensify our efforts to work with uh, faith leaders uh, on different angles. Well, yeah, and the future is now. And we're working on collecting and bringing a new group of faith leaders to Washington in September. And so we need to be very focused and targeted about who we approach and who we bring, who will be willing to speak out. Um, can I just add? Yes, yes. go ahead, Ruth. Can I just? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, I, I would like to add also two points. One of them, that I feel that after Gaza, 
that there is some comfort and easiness from some church leaders, theologians, to criticize evangelicals and Christian Zionists and put all the blame on them as if the mainstream churches are doing what they are supposed to do. They are doing their homework. But actually, the problem is there. We were appalled, angered from many of the statements of some mainstream churches in the United States and also in Europe. I mean, as if they are newcomers to the conflict, to the situation. They do not know what's going on. So this is, this is one point. We should not avoid uh, criticizing uh, and working also with the mainstream churches to lift and to uplift their positions to the standards and not giving them the comfort just to hide behind evangelicals and Christian Zionism. This is one point. The second point, actually I started to say this, I mean, more often, more than any time before, that also some of our problems, we Palestinians, came from our friends. Our friends who I think uh, they were not uh, using vocabulary, using the right words, uh, hurting us, uh, distorting the narrative. Uh, and it seems that even our friends, we they lack also political orientation and we should also work with the converted again. Uh, people say all the time that you are talking to the converted, but it seems after Gaza that we need also to work with the converted because many of the positions and the lukewarm uh, positions came from our friends, angered us even more than our opponents. So not Christian Zionism is the problem. The mainstream churches also are the problem. Second, we need also to continue educating our friends how to use their vocabulary how to analyze things, how to, to not to distort the narrative and to put the narrative in its context. You really, uh, Rafat, anticipated my next question, which is to, which is about the, the silence of the churches. <clears throat> and you both have commented on that, um, Mutter, in your, in your sermons and in your appearances and Rafat as well. What do you make of this? And um, what do you find? I know you've both been working for decades intensely with the uh, on a global level with working with the ecumenical um, uh, movement, uh, working with uh, world organizations of churches like the World Council of Churches, and um, there have been there has been some movement, but but on the whole, you've both expressed enormous disappointment. Um, what's your analysis of what the barriers are and and maybe more about how we can overcome them, particularly here in the United States? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, and I, uh, it's not just the silence, uh, Mark, uh, that troubled us uh, because some made statements, it's, it's what they said in these statements, the language used in that statement. Uh, the fact that many church statements, even those coming from our friends, seemed uh, to simply repeat the Zionist narrative that this war started in October 7th, mm -hmm. Israel has a sacred right to defend itself, mm -hmm. uh, and ignoring the context completely, accepting that this is a war of self-defense, um, and then condemning Hamas with the strongest possible language, but being silent about the crimes of Israel, even though they named them, which was interesting. Uh, now that I'm writing a book about all these statements, I, I read, you know, they name the they name the actions, but they narrate them as you know just a list of things that are happening, uh, okay. without making sometimes a moral judgment that this is wrong or that we condemn. And I, you know, I wonder, but you use the strongest language to condemn what Hamas did on October 7th. And I understand that. Hamas did horrible things. Israel has done far worse things. Why are you silent? Uh, so it's not just a silence, but it's adopting a certain, certain narrative. It's repeating the rhetoric of, of the Zionist. And I think what this maybe told me, and I might be a bit harsh, is that 
Many in the West, uh, yes, they supported us Palestinians, but they supported us based on their own grounds, their own uh, uh, premise, their own uh, presuppositions as if, maybe even out of, um, uh, you know, charity. Uh, but the 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 double standards in which they they related to two sorts of violence uh, made me question whether some of our friends also hold senses of uh, or notions of supremacy uh, in which they look at certain group of people different than they look uh, at. That. That's why we were troubled. Honestly, that is why we were troubled because uh, the the statements came from people who visited us, know the reality. Uh, and you you mentioned Germany, and I think Germany is a very, very important example here, mm -hmm. uh, of illustration of what I'm trying to say. Um, in Germany, we carried with us the reports from multiple human rights organizations and legal organizations that um, clearly said, stated, uh, that what Israel is committing is the crime of apartheid whether it's Israeli, Palestinian, or uh, international human rights organizations. And the kind of, I mean, we, there was definitely support uh, for our resolution, which we joined with our South African partners to present, uh, thankfully for the South African uh, Anglican Church. Uh, but there was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of hesitation, even. Uh, we were lectured that this is not helpful. Uh, the South Africans were called out from the main stage in the opening event of the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches. I mean, if this was a European church who partnered with us, do you think they would call them out openly from the main stage? No. So don't tell me it's not racism. And then to dictate on us Palestinians uh, what language we should use to describe our oppression uh, when we only ask to use the internationally recognized uh, uh, language about apartheid and, and right now about genocide. Uh, so we see those who are willing to support us, but then to say, don't use certain words, don't describe it with a certain language, don't ask us to boycott Israel, but we will support you. Don't ask us to call it apartheid, but we will support you. And I think uh, this doesn't work anymore. Uh, and this cannot be the path forward. Uh, for us as Kairos, we're very clear that we will not accept this. And I think, I hope churches as well in the West, uh, in the United States and Europe realize that uh, this is damaging. This is damaging to the Palestinians. This is, uh, you can't claim to be concerned about the plights of the dehumanized and the marginalized only to marginalize them again by dictating which language uh, they use. So I think this is a problem. And then the war came and it confirmed to us that this is actually true uh, with more people than we thought. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's what's been, been so shocking and so sobering. And uh, we've all we've all experienced the tone deafness um, of people in positions of responsibility and power uh, who clearly are more concerned about preserving their own power and keeping their own institutions um, from having the boat rocked. Um, than then by doing the right thing and by taking a just a human stance. We're going to talk about a pro prophetic stance. And you've both made the point very strongly that the pressure needs to come from the grassroots, particularly from young people and through coalitions with organizations that are that are committed to to social um, to social justice and to and, and to morality. Rifat, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> You, you know, as you said, I mean, we were working hard uh, over the past eight, nine months, try to influence, try to lobby, to advocate, try to, I mean, have openings with some churches and some countries. But, you know, the global church response uh, to Gaza, I mean, varied. Uh, and this reflects a complex interplay of, of theological perspectives and internal dynamics within the different denominations and geopolitical considerations, of course, influenced by broader geopolitical dynamics and the position of their respective national governments. Unfortunately, some churches, and they were even on the right side of their countries, even not, not following even the, the, the policy of, 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 their, of their governments. 
But usually churches in countries with strong political and military ties to Israel, I mean, such United States, Germany, UK, and, and, and many other European countries, faced more significant challenges, I would say, in adopting a, a more critical stance to what's going on uh, in, in, in Gaza and also in, in, uh, in the West Bank. You know, in summary, there has been some progress in the global church's response, and we need to admit this. Maybe uh, we, we speak in, in anger or in frustration, disappointment, because the urgency, because of the urgency of, 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 of the issue. But there were, I mean, churches who, who really act as a prophetic voice for, for, for justice, uh, and some others, they were either muted or silenced or trying to be balanced uh, by not saying anything. Uh, you know, I mean, this maybe needs a deeper theological reflection, maybe stronger ecumenical cooperation, maybe also a, a greater willingness uh, to take risks in advocating uh, for change, uh, for, uh, for change. You know, you usually, and I'm sorry to put it this way, but sometimes uh, we are very good in, in saying the right thing, but we do not practice it. We do not uh, uh, practice what what we preach. When we when we talk about uh, speaking truth to power, but actually we do not do it. Yeah, we are trying to accommodate. We are, are trying to adapt. We are trying also to lower our voice. When I mean comes to to take a real stance uh, different than our our governments and our uh, hierarchy. When it comes to the ecumenical organizations, and I think uh, we have also to say something about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the World Council of Churches, for instance, they issued several statements. Uh, they did uh, more than one solidarity visits to Palestine. Uh, the latest statement coming from the executive committee, I mean, it had very good points, but in general, uh, it lagged the right narrative, it lagged the accurate uh, vocabularies, and this is what pushed us to, as Kairos Palestine, uh, to send a letter trying to explain that words uh, have power, uh, and you have to have the, the right wordings, the right description of the situation if you would like to have a remedy. I mean, a good doctor will, will say the illness as it is in order to find the right medicine. But when you put the blame on two parties, when you, as if there are two equal countries fighting each other, or when you say Israel is fighting Hamas, and I mean, more than 20, 20 something thousand people, civilians do not have anything to do where we are killed. I mean, just to be merciful when using uh, the vocabulary uh, in order to give the audience the right uh, uh, approach, the right uh, understanding of, of the situation. Uh, we know also that some of these churches and ecumenical bodies, uh, they cannot respond in the way we want or they wish maybe. Uh, this is because of internal divisions within congregations, members. I'd like to start uh, my address by thanking the Schiller Institute uh, for this opportunity to address your esteemed conference. I'm okay. sorry, I'm not going I to... I don't know what's going on. Sorry, Rufus. Yeah, sorry, sorry. And pressure from external political and financial interests. I mean... And maybe also a fear of backlash from various parties, uh, Zionism, Christian Zionism, the threat to be labeled anti-Semitic, etc. Okay, so you, you, um, again, you're anticipating a question I wanted to ask, and you have mentioned Christian Zionism and you have mentioned theology. So, um, you know, the 2009, the Kairos Palestine document gave rise to a global network of Kairos organizations. It was very, very effective as a theological document. Since then, there's been the cry of hope. There have been other statements that have come out. We have Kairos documents from a dozen other churches in, 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 on different continents. How does the theology continue 
to speak today. In, in, in fact, you could say that it's even more pointed, especially because you have uh, this furor about anti-Semitism and Christian Zionism is beginning to be challenged directly by, by the, even the mainstream churches in Europe and the United States. Um, how does the theology or can the theology um, be an actual tool in engaging the churches? And uh, what do you what do you both think about that now? How do we operationalize it? Yeah, theology is important, and uh, Kairos put us on the right track. Uh, Fifteen years from the first Kairos document, as we reflect on it. Uh, we understand why it was much needed. And if 15 years ago it was a Kairos moment, how much more it is now. Um, Kairos spoke in very clear and general terms about uh, the nature of God, the importance of justice, even uh, the need to resist. I think if we consider uh, reflecting on theology now in a new way, um, I would say that uh, what we need is to uh, use also the language of uh, not just settler colonialism. Let, let me say something about Christian Zionism that I've been saying more, more recently. We used to think of Christian Zionism as a theological um, concept that comes from the Bible. And we used to go to the Bible to try to respond to the arguments of Christian Zionism. But I think a more honest approach, real approach to Christian Zionism is to look at Zionism for what it truly is. Zionism sought to establish a homeland for the Jewish people on someone else's land. So by definition, Zionism uh, is colonialism and settler colonialism. To do so, they engaged in uh, a systematic act of ethnic cleansing in 1948. Then they built a system of apartheid in the land, which is very well established now, uh, and more recently are engaged in a, in a genocide. So uh, rather than going to the Bible and asking, does the Bible teach one, two, three? I think we need to ask ourselves, does the Bible really endorse settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, apartheid, and genocide? For Christians, I want to ask, can you put the word Christian before these four issues? Uh, this is the kind of Kairos language we use right now. We have to stop pretending that Christian Zionism is just another way of reading scripture. No, Christian Zionism is what I just said. Settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, apartheid, and genocide. And can we continue to support that those issues under the name of the Bible? This is the real question that I think our theology demands uh, from us uh, right now. This is what I hope churches debate right now, rather than going to a text here and a text there and trying to say, does the Bible say this and does the Bible say that? I mean, I've, I've done this homework. I've, I've written a PhD on the <laughs> issue on the promised land. But at the end of the day, we have to deal with Zionism for its fruits on the ground, what is happening on the ground. This is what's happening. And again, I ask, can we put the word Christian before ethnic cleansing and genocide and settler colonialism and, and, uh, and apartheid. I think a related question, Mutter, is can Christians be unapologetically Christian about that? Because if you look at the Old Testament, you can find ample, ample support for uh, ethnic cleansing uh, and genocide. It's right there. Um, what, what the New Testament comes to do is to, uh, is to sweep that away. And most Christians, since uh, since the, the, the genocide of the Jews in Europe have been reluctant to do that. Um, and so there is a lot of theological work that has to be done because, you know, what I heard from the South Africans was we have to go back and reread our Bibles. And I think we do have to go back to the Bible. And, uh, and <laughs> if I can use the word cleanse, cleanse Christian belief, of uh, of the ethnic cleansing and the colonialism that is that can definitely be found in the Jewish scripture. Absolutely, and Mark, I don't want to 
I, I know this is not what you meant, but I don't want to put the problem as if it's only in the Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, and then Jesus corrected things. Uh, because I know of many uh, concerned Jews who are opposed to Zionism and ethnic cleansing and who would uh, read those scriptures differently, uh, not as a call for uh, a genocide today, but as maybe, uh, I don't know, explanations of events that happened uh, at certain times. Uh, so I think those interpretations today that seem to accept this or openly call for a genocide, and we've certainly seen them, We've certainly seen pastors call for this genocide or justify it or defend it or the use of the just war theory, I think all point to uh, deeper realities, deeper beliefs uh, that exist in the Western church, uh, namely of supremacy, uh, of this fascination with violence as if violence solves things. Uh, the just war theory, uh, here you go, Jesus telling us to defend our, uh, you know, to, to love the enemy, seek the way of love and nonviolence, only for Christians to create a whole notion of public theology that completely goes against everything Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mountain, which I can't, I can't understand. Uh, so there is also this um, belief that violence solves things. And uh, uh, there is this... Uh, fascination with power and domination uh, and I'm ashamed I'm ashamed to look at our history as as Christianity in the last 200 years and to say how many genocides did we witness committed by so-called Christians it's it's horrifying it's really horrifying uh, so it's time to not just look at uh, uh, another look about does the Bible teach in Genesis 12 that we must support Israel? I think this is deeper than that. It's about the dehumanization of others. That's why I say it's supremacy, because once you dehumanize other nations, other peoples, it becomes perfectly fine to kill them because they're less humans. Uh, to serve a, a certain goal that you can make, promoting democracy and freedom, the second Gulf War, colonialism, or bringing Christianity as in colonialism, and so on. So it begins with a sense of supremacy. It begins with a sense of feeling better than the other and the others are uh, less humans. And as I said, it's uh, the insistence on going against the teachings of Jesus about nonviolence and love. I mean, it's, it's, it's beyond my comprehension that there is this obsession and, and belief that we as Christians should go to war, just war theories and so on. I mean, war should be lamented. Uh, war should be not encouraged. Uh, war should be the last resort. Uh, I mean, what happened to... We need to look deeper than simply uh, Genesis 12 or Romans 11, as some people think the problem is. Well, I mean, you can go back all the way to the doctrine of discovery and to and, and maybe to Constantine himself, if you want to look for a church, church involvement in all of the things that you're describing. So they really were talking about a church struggle. And again, the South Africans have taught us about that. Uh, Rifat? I mean, um, I don't have anything to add when it comes to theology. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I think I don't have anything to add on this. <laughs> I mean, I think that, that you bring up you both bring up um, the what well, seems to be a powerful force in the churches today, to um, that reveals, I think, the 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 colonial the settler colonial DNA in the church itself. Uh, the church has been deeply involved with that for not hundreds of years, but that you know, close to its whole history, certainly since since Constantine. So. It brings to my mind again the the question of how do we involve not people who were brought up, you know, several you know generations ago that were schooled in this intensely philo Judaic, let's make up for church sins against the Jews theology, and to the younger generation that's coming up and seeing the world today and realizing that if the church is to have any relevance at all, it must take on the issues that are relevant today. And, and colonialism and neoliberalism are not just, you know, Zionism and what Israel is doing is only one expression of things that are going on on a global basis. And so people coming up are, I think, intensely interested in this. Um, 
and much of what the two of you are saying is pointing to the fact that we need to engage these minds, these consciences, um, who are ready and willing to take on the institutional, the institutions of government and churches that are fairly stuck in, in um, defense of the status quo and making liberal statements and misusing language to justify what's going on, as, as, as you mentioned that you hear all the time Monter, when you're talking to, to people. Um, so we really are talking about a coalition, uh, about coalition building and organizing and to do that. I wonder, do you feel that we can do that in the context of the churches? And um, what would be the key elements in your experience of being able to engage those elements in the churches um, that can challenge the status quo, which is unacceptable? Maybe I can, I can sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, First of all, I, I think churches have to make a review for themselves and of themselves. They should ask themselves, including our churches in Palestine, why young people are not interested anymore in the church. Uh, today, for instance, one of our major problems in Palestine that as Christians, you know, we are very few left. And very few of the few left from us is engaged in the public sphere. And if we have youth who are engaged, they are engaged outside the church because they don't see that the church is their representative or, or the right platform for them to, to practice what they believe. So the church, without such kind of critical evaluation for for what's happening and to continue saying that there is a secularization in the world and that's why people are dropping out of, of, of churches, hiding behind such statements without going to the bone and to the core of the issue. That to, today the church, when there is uh, no cause to defend, no clarity in where they stand, this doesn't approach young people to join to join the church. So first of all, there should be a critical evaluation and review of the church and all Christian organizations. I mean, it's not enough to say that people are not interested anymore in churches, etc. We need to find the right the right reason. You know, when we uh, when we issued Carus Palestine in two thousand and nine, I mean, actually. Kairos Palestine, in addition to be uh, a, a tool uh, for our uh, young people to steadfast and to be resilient, to give them a new vision of what they can do and what should be done, etc. But actually, Kairos Palestine was, was a way to, to reintroduce the Palestinian issue uh, in a different way to reconnect or to start a relation on different uh, uh, on different bases between the global church and the christians uh, in palestine so it was it was a way of a communication tool to find uh, a, a proper relationship between the global church and the palestinian people and when we when we issued the the, the document we spoke about the type of solidarity, the type of advocacy Christians are called to stand for. Uh, and we spoke about how churches can amplify the Palestinian voices. How can they amplify also the voices who seek peace with justice? Uh, how can they ensure their narratives that it's being heard on broader, uh, on broader level? So, the, the, the document itself was our way of communicating with the global church, trying to remind them with, with the principles, uh, how can they support the nonviolent resistance of, of, the, of the Palestinian people? How can they uh, back initiatives which promote a peaceful uh, solution for, 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 uh, for, for the issue? 
uh, how can we recommit ourselves to justice? So I, I, I think I think what, what we need is not just uh, forging a new uh, alliances and, by, and keeping our, uh, our household as it is. We need to start with ourselves. We need to have a very critical review and evaluation of what we are doing in order to, to reach this uh, moment where we can really build uh, a wider and, and more uh, global uh, alliances and coalitions uh, with others. But if we keep doing business as usual, I don't think we'll be interested to social movements or to students' movements to, to join uh, such a lukewarm type of establishments. You know, the um, we discuss this a lot in our meetings at Global Kairos, of course, that the concept of status confessionis, of, of, of confessional status, um, really applies. I'm reminded of the the case in, in again, this is in the 80s, when uh, eight um, black uh, pastors from South Africa came to the World the um, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches uh, meeting in Canada, and they refused to take communion with the with their uh, in, in public with uh, at that meeting, and this is an, an international meeting. He said, we will not sit with you here and at the Lord's table because we cannot do that at home. Our churches in South Africa are officially segregated racially. And to its credit, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches said, okay, thank you for bringing this to our attention. We are now in a confessional state. None of the church business can proceed as usual until we've dealt with this. And they did the Protestant equi equivalent of excommunicating throwing out of the communion those churches in South Africa that were practicing that. Now that was, if you excuse the expression, a very black and white situation. Do we have that kind of situation now? How, one of the people in the chat asked, how can we give our church leaders sleepless nights so that they realize, to your point, Rufat, that there needs to be a review, I would go, say even stronger, maybe a revolution, maybe a, a reformation in the churches to say that we are not with Jesus as long as we stand aside. And, and what is the action that has to happen now that is not business as usual that will bring this to the attention of the church leaders and make them act because that might have an effect on national policy. When Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher finally joined the sanctions against South Africa, which followed the Reformed Church's action, that really changed things. Yeah, exactly, exactly that, Mark. I mean, the language, the demand, the understanding, the analysis, everything, the old ways no longer work. We need to be, and maybe I should blame ourselves as Palestinians for being a little bit too peaceful, you know? So for example, uh, uh, I'm reading the comments, and uh, I, I I agree, uh, Don, Don, our good friend Don is saying the movement we are seeking must be interfaith, absolutely, progressive and so on, progressive Jews, if not now Muslims, blacks, and uh, absolutely, but I want to add one more thing, for example, it has to be an anti-apartheid, it cannot be a peace uh, uh, movement, it cannot be a reconciliation movement, it has to be clear in its language. This is an anti-apartheid movement. The demand is sanction Israel, isolate Israel. This should be the demand. This is the only thing that can work right now. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I was thinking today, I was doing another webinar. Maybe I do too many webinars. And uh, I remembered a webinar I did to faith leaders. I think it was back in October when we were really angry by the mass killing that took place in the first two weeks of the war. And I said to them, uh, and I was very animated, that uh, at the end of the day, Israel would continue with this mass killing for two reasons. First, they're not paying for it. You are paying for it with your tax. And second, they will not be held accountable. Uh, this is my fear, you know. And the first part is happening. America is happy to continue to send the weapons. Uh, they get rebuked by uh, their, you know, by Netanyahu if they are uh, a week late. Uh, 
uh, and then they pretend they are uh, not happy by Netanyahu's rebuke, then they invite him to the Congress to lecture them and send him the money and weapons again. So they're not going to pay for it. They can make sure that this genocide is not going to cost them. And second, they're not going to be held accountable. Uh, so unless this changes, I don't think we can make any progress. So I don't want to take part in any peace coalition, any uh, get together and so on, if the language is not clear and the demand is not clear. And again, maybe we should blame ourselves as Palestinians and Palestinian Christians for our approach in the past. Maybe we were too naive, I don't know. Uh, but the, the, the reality around demands that we act in new ways. Mm -hmm. Can we get um, church leaders globally to sign on to a movement that is growing now to um, to address the International Olympic Committee to bar Israel from participating in the games in France? That's I a don't... game changer, folks. That is a game changer. I mean, if faith leaders don't have the courage to do so, then I, I really have no hope. This is this is my issue right now. We need to be given the demands. This should be it. This should be the task of faith leaders. Can they be reminded? of uh, the famous case of South Africa, where that happened. And where Nelson Mandela was was still in, was still in prison. And the rugby team from South Africa was not permitted to compete internationally. And it changed, can they be shamed, can leaders today be shamed into supporting the same thing now? Declaring apartheid a heresy, as you say, it's, it, it is a heresy. Um, and we will be, ourselves heretics and not with Jesus if we uh, if we do not demand of you that Israel not be allowed to participate in the games in Paris you know I I, I truly believe that our churches failed in the test not just on, on Palestine I think they failed in the test I mean for four decades ago uh, and and in, in 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 most of the cases, and this is what we keep hearing from from friends, actually uh, leaders of ecumenical bodies, leaders of churches, uh, when they tell us, you know, you do not understand how challenging our context is. I mean, if we do so, we will lose friends here. If we do so, we will lose members. If we will do that, we will lose congregations, etc. So at the end, it becomes as if the superficial unity of the church or the ecumenical body is done on the principles cost. Mm -hmm. So we are ready to sacrifice our principles, our values, our morals, our ethics for the sake of this kind of superficial unity. And this is exactly the type of questions we keep hearing from our, I mean, friends and opponents alike, Yeah, that, no, no, you are too radical. Unfortunately, we reached a level where someone, I, I, I mean, very often I say, one of the most complicated and difficult religions is Christianity. Because they claim that love is the most important commandment. Love your enemy, something you cannot, I mean, avoid it. You cannot just compromise it. But it's easy to be said in the West, it is easy to be said in, 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 in an area where there is no conflict. I adore my, I mean, if I am, I lived in Switzerland for, for some years and I adored my neighbors because I never saw any of them. But when you live in a situation like in Palestine and everything pushes you to hate your enemy, your neighbors, this is where the commandment of love takes its way. Yeah, This is where you show your Christianity. We take our Christianity in a very light manner, and then we become as radicals. And this is exactly what happened to us in Germany, in Karlsruhe, I mean, during the WCC General Assembly. When we tried to remind them with their Christianity, with our faith, we became the radicals. We were the black sheep who was chased out of the, of the I don't know what to call it in, in, in English. So, no, there is no other way unless we really take a, a, 
a true Christian stance. I will not say radical or revolutionary because this is how Christianity should be. Jesus never said it was supposed to be easy, right? When he went about recruiting his, his disciples. He said, you have yeah. to let go of everything that you're committed to, all of your way of life, whatever, and follow me. And, and what, what adds to the frustration, Mark, that we see the churches when it comes to, for instance, I don't like to make comparison, but when it comes to Ukraine, for instance, you will see that the churches are the, at the forefront, yeah? Uh, I mean, criticizing Russia, taking a more progressive and, and, and solid position against the war, against the invasion, etc., etc., they are ready also to do the same when it comes about Iran, about China, about Russia, about Syria, about Iraq or whatever. But when it comes about Israel, they will lose their voice. And they will lose their principles as well. So what the difference, of course, is that you do not have an entire Western, Western not only Western, but in the global South as well. Um, uh, Christian world that is firmly committed to protecting uh, the Jewish people and and embracing the Jewish people's uh, official uh, yearning to take possession of the Holy Land and too bad for the Palestinians. So the <laughs> there's an enormous barrier here that didn't exist, for example, with the South African struggle. Yeah. Yeah, the fear of anti-Semitism, I mean, this is something, I mean, this is an important issue. There is a price which has to be paid yeah, when you align with the Palestinians. Yes, and we Jews can, can, can plead with Christians to pay the price. You know, that if you really want to love us, don't love us by allowing us to sink deeper and deeper into sin. It's not good for us either. We can plead with you. Christians about that, but it has not seemed to have had too much effect yet. But maybe we just have to keep on that course. But Munter, what do you think? I think that um, we cannot, uh, we should not accept to to be bullied, uh, especially right now by these accusations. Uh, and the weaponization of the charge of anti-Semitism, which undermines real anti-Semitism. Yeah. Uh, and I would even, you know, uh, argue that Zionism is self-destructive even to the Jewish values and, and what Judaism is supposed to stand for. Um, moreover, you know, um, I continue to be shocked and by the hypocrisy of those who have the audacity to call us with these terms, given that some uh, of the most violent and aggressive Christian Zionist ideologies are by definition anti-Semitic. Uh, they, you know, they believe Jews will be massacred and then converted to Christianity. They uh, utilize them for their role in the end times they write books about it they make profits from these books about the end times and and so on and then they have the audacity to call us so i think we need to challenge this narrative we need to stand against this kind of bullying and actually we need to call those christian zionists out for uh, the the the, the anti-semitism that they promote uh as well uh, again uh, we cannot go back to where we were before october 7th in which I felt many times we as church activists uh, felt as if we're walking on eggshells. Uh, and I, I will not go back. I know for a, for a fact what happened in Gaza could happen in the West Bank. This is our biggest fear. I am in Bethlehem. I see what's happening. Uh, and we've warned for years uh, that what happened in Gaza is about to happen. We saw it coming. This is the sad part. Many of us saw it coming. Uh, and I'm, I'm not claiming to be a genius or a prophet, you know. You don't have to be a genius to see 
what's coming. So now I look at the West Bank. You don't have to be a genius to figure out that a catastrophe is coming. And with the uh, the the, the uh, settlers being given these uh, unresponsible amount of weapons and being allowed to use it, and they know they cannot get punished. You know, every day, every day we hear about new attacks from the settlers in remote areas in the West Bank. Every day, and this could move easily to a, a city in the West Bank, to a town. So we cannot go back to ground zero where we were in which let's plead, let's find the middle ground, uh, let's consider the language. No, I mean, friends, uh, lives are at stake uh, and, and we cannot uh, simply go back to where we were, as I said, in which it felt as if walking on eggshells. I, I think, uh, Mark, we should give a tribute and, and respect for the memory of Mark Ellis, yeah, who passed away two days ago or three days ago, when he spoke about the ecumenical deal. Mm -hmm. And I think this deal is still going on. And I mean, I think we need to, to restudy and to revisit the literature of late Mark Ellis. I think that's very true. And the ecumenical deal is alive and well. And in fact, it's getting stronger because uh, the, the, the forces of the status quo and to protect their power um, see that they have to be basically pull out the biggest gun, the biggest weapon that they have. And, they're, and, they're, and they are using it and it continues to be effective. So my dear friends, we've We've taken on the big questions. We've talked about uh, the risks. We've talked about the urgency. We've talked about the enormous challenges before us. I'm so grateful to you for spending this time with us. Um, and uh, and I think for, for all of us who have joined today, I feel like we are we're gathered here in this enormous, deep, wide community of of grief and of compassion and of love and this is what we have uh, we are all together we are all together in this and uh, and we will not stop and uh, clearly the two of you have not have not have not stopped as we've watched you uh, in certainly in the last in, in the last uh, eight months uh, go through the hell that you that you've been experiencing um i would ask you if uh because we will close if you have any any uh, uh more words to uh to leave us with um be, mike before you before you throw the slides up if we just give give them another uh, uh give munter and uh and refight a chance No, I, I would I would just say that uh, it is the time now for for more hard work and uh, for uh, for more efforts and uh, I, I I think the question about how can we build uh, alliances with uh, with other movements uh, social movements student movements interfaith etc I think, uh, this should be taken in a very serious manner and try to put a strategy, as I read in some of the comments, how we can do this. Because we cannot just, uh, I mean, uh, continue doing business as usual. As I said earlier, we need really uh, to build on what happened in the last eight, nine months and to start in a different strategy. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to end by saying first, thank you to all of you. Uh, I recognize many of the names, many are friends, many are old friends, many are champions in advocacy, many are uh, uh, champions of costly solidarity. So let me say that uh, because I'm speaking to friends, we have to ask more from our friends because we don't, you know, we're not going to expect this from uh, the outside. So. We're grateful, but we're asking as always for more because so much is at stake. So much is at stake. 
Uh, and, and let me just also remind you that uh, this is about our collective humanity first. And second, you know, when I say collective humanity, it's about our commitment to make this world a better place as humans. And second, this is about the credibility of our Christian witness, which uh, as many of you have heard, you know, you can't imagine how many people told me they left the church because of Gaza and keep coming back to, you know, the things we're saying. So uh, we need this now. This is needed. This voice of courage, of integrity is so much needed now. The church needs us as, just as much as the uh, Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank need us. And to be honest, even the Israelis uh, as well, if we can even dare to continue to think of a future in which we share this land uh, together. So thank you. Thank you both very much.